God confronts the faithlessness of His people to draw them to repentance. This is what we will explore in this week's online Bible study. Go ahead and hit that subscribe button so that you never miss an episode. It never ceases to amaze me how easy it is to put my relationship with God on cruise control. Somehow we as human beings are able to mutate the beauty of godly routine, healthy rhythms into disfigured zombie-esque patterns. And without noticing it, we can become nonchalant and numb as we inch away from the God we claim to love. This is where the people of God found themselves at the time of the prophet Malachi. The people's hearts were disengaged from the acts that should have been filling their hearts with awe, stirring their affections, and directing their lives. In tender love, God sent His messenger to expose their wicked hearts and to renew their hearts through the call to repentance, a call to worship. Check out this quote. The inner essence of worship is to know God truly and then respond from the heart to that knowledge by valuing God, treasuring God, prizing God, enjoying God, being satisfied with God above all earthly things. And then that deep, restful, joyful satisfaction in God overflows in demonstrable acts of praise from the lips and demonstrable acts of love in serving others for the sake of Christ. Here's a question. What factors contribute to putting our relationship with God on cruise control? Maybe it's self-focus, laziness, sin, feeling abandoned by God and others. Put your answer down in the comments. Through the prophet Malachi, God rebuked his people because their religious activity was leading them away from God. Their hearts were focused on delights other than God. In His grace and mercy, God was wooing them back through a series of warnings, each addressing distorted views of Him that had diminished their delight and brought decay to their worship and spiritual endeavors. Though they had questioned His love, the Lord wanted them back and called them to repentance, showing the depths of His power, wisdom, holiness, and grace in a way that points us to a definitive call to turn to the cross of Jesus. Here's our first point. God warns His people of having no fear in their worship. Read with me Malachi chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. A son honors his father, and a servant his master. If then I am a father, where is my honor? And if I am a master, where is my fear? Says the Lord of hosts to you, O priest who despise my name. But you say, how have we despised your name? By offering polluted food upon my altar. But you say, how have we polluted you? by saying that the Lord's table may be despised. When you offer blind animals in sacrifice, is that not evil? And when you offer those that are lame or sick, is that not evil? Present that to your governor. Will he accept you or show you favor? Says the Lord of hosts. And now entreat the favor of God, that he may be gracious to us. With such a gift from your hand, will he show favor to any of you? Says the Lord of hosts. Oh, that there were one among you who would shut the doors, that you might not kindle fire on my altar in vain. I have no pleasure in you, says the Lord of hosts, and I will not accept an offering from your hand. How we view God shapes how we live. In other words, what we believe about God, is He our Father, is He our Lord, functions like a set of building blocks for our relationship with Him. The rhetoric God used here unveiled the heart of the priest and the people, showing that they had a distorted picture of Him. As complex and tedious as the Old Testament sacrificial system seems, every pigeon, dove, bull, goat, or lamb offered, whether to atone for a sin or as a gift of honor and gratitude, was intended to be an expression of the Israelites' relationship with God. By bringing blind and defiled animals as their sacrifice of worship, contrary to God's law, the people were communicating how little weight God and His Word held in their lives in comparison to themselves or others. The people's intention was well as their action mattered greatly. God judged both their intentions and actions as sinful. Therefore, 
fire they had kindled for their sacrifices was useless. God's line of questioning for his people through the prophet Malachi was straightforward and dynamic, like a skilled lawyer presenting an airtight case on the way to a conviction. What are some things that can dim or distort our view of God? Maybe it's wealth or health or family or the busyness and routine of church or sin or maybe this fallen world. Put your answers down in the comments below. Malachi's contemporaries were Ezra and Nehemiah. As a post-exilic prophet, Malachi was speaking to a people who had experienced the faithfulness of God in returning them to the land and providing for their protection and revival. The people had heard of God's faithfulness through His Word and experienced it themselves, yet they still questioned God's commitment to them. They had spiritual amnesia, forgetting both the love and the glory of God, which made them spiritually anemic. Spiritual amnesia isn't just a failure to remember cognitively, it is also a failure to remember emotionally. It is both the essence and the cause of faithlessness in God's people. The psalmist described this condition well in Psalm 106 verse 7. Our fathers, when they were in Egypt, did not consider your wondrous works. They did not remember the abundance of your steadfast love, but rebelled by the sea at the Red Sea. The Jews' spiritual amnesia made them spiritually anemic. There was no passion in their sacrifices, only routine. There was no honor in their worship, only lip service and detached activity. They were starving spiritually because they failed to draw close to God, who gives life to the soul. Hence, the book of Malachi opens with God's declaration, I have loved you. Yet the people respond, How have you loved us? They had forgotten all he had done for them. Listen to this essential doctrine, God's glory. The glory of God is his manifest work, the way he represents his perfect character through his activity. It also refers to his excellent reputation and is given as one of the reasons we are to praise his name. Another sense of the word is the inherent beauty of God, the unbearably brightness and beauty of his being as his as he radiates his own attributes and characteristics for all to witness. The scripture speaks of humanity as having fallen short of God's glory because we have rejected the purpose for which God created us to glorify him. Here's our second point. God warns his people of having no trust in their giving. Read with me Malachi chapter 3 verses 8 through 12. Will man rob God? Ye, you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, and you bring, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house, and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven for you, and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more deed. I will rebuke the devourer for you, so that it will not destroy the fruits of your soil, and your vine in the field shall not fail to bear, says the Lord of hosts. Then all nations will call you blessed, for you will be a land of delight, says the Lord of hosts. Because our use of money is connected to our faith, it will always be connected to our worship. Therefore, it's only logical that the decay of the Jews' worship would show up in how they viewed and managed their resources. Not only did their distorted view of God reduce him from a generous king to a potential consultant for them, they found themselves robbing God, withholding what was due in honor, faith, and worship. It seems God's people were still in recovery mode from the destruction of Jerusalem. They weren't where they wanted to be economically, and God didn't seem to be helping them in that regard. They may have felt justified to withhold their support of God's temple because of their poverty, but poor circumstances don't justify disobedience. God wanted His people to flourish, but according to His covenant, their disobedience had resulted in His curse upon them. Their lack was not the result of God's faithlessness, but their own. Despite being robbed by his people, God's love for them was relentless. 
So in love, God disciplined them with his curse, even as he confronted and called them back to faith through revisiting how they viewed and used their finances. If they continued on their current path, they would have continued in a cycle of spiritual deficiency with an additional economic consequences, further distancing them from their God. How should a biblical view of God affect the way we view and use our finances and resources? Well, we are stewards of our money and resources to use them for God's purposes. Whether we have much or little, what we have is what we need, and we should be content with that. God supplies us with resources to be used for supporting the gospel mission around the world. Put your answer in the comments. The Jews were bringing some of their resources to the temple, but not the full tenth required of them. So they weren't acting out of obedience, generosity, or faith. God delights in being generous. So he invited his people to test him, not for his sake, but for others, or, but for theirs. And they would see the fruits of their faithful obedience. God is not in need, but we are. And we need to see that God is good, gracious, and generous beyond our wildest imagination. Malachi chapter 3, verses 8 through 12 does not put God in a box or turn him into some kind of cosmic butler. What this passage does is present us with a picture of our generous God who invites his people to test him and investigate his good character. God was challenging the Jews to rediscover a right view of him. If they tested him in faith, they would find much more than they had bargained for. Not a butler or a miser, but a majestic provider who wants good for his people and his generous he and is generous beyond comparison. In the hands of predatory preachers and leaders, Malachi 3 verses 8 through 12 has done significant damage to the lives of people through what is known as the prosperity gospel, which makes God a, a means to a, fin a financial end and money as a means to manip manipulate him. Pulling this passage from its biblical context allows people to claim that God's goal is to make people wealthy and healthy without qualification. Yet God spoke this promise specifically to His people in the promised land prior to the first coming of Christ, in whom all the promises of land and blessing find their yes. Jesus' example through His life, death, and resurrection and exaltation frames the way we understand God's promises of prosperity. Humility precedes exaltation. Jesus' followers are called not to live for the blessings of this world, but to use them for God's glory and His gospel as they live for the blessings of the heavenly city that will arrive when Jesus comes again. It's common to hear the word tithe used as a kind of shorthand for giving and generosity. The word itself literally means tenth and comes from the Old Testament, where tithing was one of several offerings. In all, the Old Testament mandated giving 25% or more of one's possessions to various purposes and causes. So, as we look to the scriptures, both in Old Testament laws and New Testament encouragement, we commend tithing. And know that Jesus acknowledged the Pharisees' act of tithing, though the heart behind the act was lacking in Matthew chapter 23. We encourage people to tithe in our churches, but we encourage those not tithing to give generously and proportionately to their income and encourage people who are tithing to grow in their generosity even more. Here's our last point. God warns his people of having no faith in their living. Read with me Malachi chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Your words have been hard against me, says the Lord. But you say, how have we spoken against you? You have said, it is vain to serve God. What is the profit of our keeping this charge or of walking as in mourning before the Lord of hosts? And how now we call the arrogant blessed. Evil doers not only prosper, but they put God to the test and they escape. Again, God was indicting the Jews for their faithlessness, this time because they were jealous of the wicked who tested his character. To them, God's justice delayed looked like justice denied. So they were caught in a mindset where faithlessness looked like wisdom and faithfulness like foolishness. 
What is the gain of obedience? What is the gain of relationship with God? The people could not could find no adequate answer to these questions. Yet God will bless faith and obedience one day and for all eternity. Knowing the difficulty often associated with obedience, we are tempted to claim e the easy blessings associated with disobedience. We want blessings without the cost, a crown without the cross. This temptation is insidious and satanic because it's what the enemy of our soul loves to offer us and how he attempts to lead our hearts astray. Satan's temptation of Jesus demonstrated this dynamic. Satan offered Jesus all the kingdoms of the world if he would bow down in worship to the devil. Conceivably, Jesus would have been elevated as king over the entire world and bypassed the cross if he bowed to the devil's demands. Yet an infinitely more glorious inheritance and exaltation would come to Jesus after he made purification for sin, sitting down at the right hand of the Father. There was a glorious blessing and exaltation and salvation for us to be experienced through His obedience, even obedience to the point of dying on a cross. Though obedience might prove difficult and might seem like it leads to a curse for a season, ultimately, obedience leads to blessings both in the case of Jesus and in the case of God's faithful people. Through every complaint and accusation the Jews made against God, he remained committed to them. He called them out for their sinful perceptions of his goodness, justice, grace, and patience. But he also appealed to them to fear him and to obey him rightly. In grace, God was working to reestablish their relationship and rebuild their confidence in him. As the prophetic book of Malachi comes to a close, some people do respond in faith to God's calls for relationship and intimacy. They feared the Lord and esteemed His name, resulting in obedience to the Lord in their lives. For these faithful few, God promised His remembrance, His presence, His compassion, and His reward. God affirmed that there is indeed a difference between the ones who serve God and those who don't. Those who serve Him in faith and fear will not only gain His reward, but His loving, faithful presence as a father. They gain God Himself. The gain of a child serving his or her father is joy. It's the growing relationship and intimacy expressed by the smile of a father as he proclaims over his child, I'm pleased. In a greater way, the gain of serving God is a growing relationship and intimacy with God Himself. God pursues people for them to live as His treasured possession. But apart from His work in our hearts and lives, we will only speak harsh words against our Creator. We can do no better than half-hearted devotion to this deity because we cannot change our sinful hearts on our own. In our sin, we are condemned to finding wickedness and as the wisest course of action. We may try to cover up our spiritual anemia with religious activities such as offering defiled sacrifices or bringing mediocre tithes and contributions. But unless we address the sickness of our sinful hearts, we will be condemned with the wicked. The cure, of course, is Jesus, God's Son sent for our salvation. Only by faith in Him will our hearts be renewed and our ears hear those blessed words from our Father. This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. What does it look like to live by faith in Jesus, the Son of God? Well, striving to follow the example that Jesus set in faithful obedience to the Father, or choosing obedience to, to God and His Word, even when it will come with negative consequences from the world living to make Jesus our highest priority in life through our actions and our words of proclaiming His gospel, rejecting the wickedness that seems to prosper in this world because we aren't living for this world but the one to come, living in obedience not to gain God's approval but because that is already granted to God's children by faith in Jesus. What are your answers? I'll put them down in the comments below. You know, the poignant words of, of God through Malachi pierce the heart. You don't love me. You don't honor me. 
I would rather stop sacrificing altogether. You rob me. You consider following me in my ways as life-taking, not life-giving. Your fear of my name has dimmed and become shrouded by the desires of your hearts. You know, these words force deep and thoughtful examination of our own hearts and lives. The piercing experienced by some hearers lead to a type of healing through wounding, cut, laid bare, and broken by the realities of the heart, but then comforted, clothed, and made whole by the realities of God's grace. The last word in the Old Testament is curse, a reminder of the consequence of our sin. But in the New Testament, one of the first words we hear from Jesus is blessing. The one who bears our curse is the one who brings us blessing. In him we have forgiveness and new life. These blessings speak of his great worth and invite us to worship him from hearts cut and comforted so that all people everywhere would know and feel the same. Because all our sin is forgiven in Christ, we take worship seriously to magnify his great worth so that all people everywhere will know his name. Here are some ways for you to apply God's Word to your life. How do you need to respond to the good news of Jesus in your worship, giving, and living? What are some ways your church can stir up each other's affections for God in light of His attributes? How will you change your personal financial stewardship to reflect the value and worth of following and trusting Jesus? Let us know one thing that you can do this week to respond to the truth of God's Word and put it down in the comments below. Check out this quote. The remarkable thing about fearing God is that when you fear God, you fear nothing else. Whereas if you fear, whereas if you do not fear God, you fear everything else. Would you pray with me? Father, you love us too deeply to let us settle for shallow worship. For we were made to enjoy and esteem you according to your worth. By the Spirit, lead us to live with repentant fear toward you, recognizing not only your goodness and power, but also the grace you have demonstrated through your Son, Jesus, in whom we have the forgiveness of sins. Thank you for drawing us to yourself through the reconciliation Christ accomplished in his death and resurrection. Amen. Remember that God confronts the faithlessness of His people to draw them to repentance. You know, Max Licato said, God loves you just the way you are, but He refuses to leave you that way. You know, God loved you so much that He sent His Son to live the perfect life you couldn't live, to die the sinner's death you deserve, and and He defeated sin and death by rising from the grave. Put your faith and trust in Jesus today. If you haven't done so, please subscribe to our channel. Click that button so you never miss an episode. Also, hit the like button if you enjoyed this week's Bible study. And if you didn't, hit the dislike button. Check out our amazing church at cbcmaysville.com. And one last thing, share this video so that we can get others into God's Word. I'll see you next week. God bless.